Man, we started this series last week, and today we're going to jump into the book of Joshua, and over the next uh, eight weeks, we are going to be looking at principles uh, that led Joshua as the leader of the children of Israel, but also the children of Israel to embrace everything that God had for them. And uh, what we're going to look at today is what we see in Joshua chapter 1. It's kind of an echo. You'll hear it three times as we read through the passage today. It's an echo where God looks at Joshua, but not just Joshua, but also the people. And God says, be strong and courageous. And then there's an echo a few verses later where God says, be strong and courageous. And then there's an echo a few uh, verses later where God says, be strong and courageous. So as you and I journey into this 2023, I want to encourage us to hear that echo all the way from uh, past and the communication that God had with Joshua and the children of Israel to be strong and courageous, but that when you leave here today, you would hear that same echo in your own heart and your own mind as you say, God, I want to develop some spiritual momentum. I want to get back on track with you. And that's what this series is about. And so today it starts with the encouragement to be strong and courageous. I want you to know, as you saw in the video, it, it, how many of you have ever just looked at NASCAR and watched those guys going three wide, 190 miles an hour around the track, and you say, that's a little crazy, right? And you're like, man, how much courage must they have? to just keep their foot on the gas and roll, and it's just crazy, and they're like bumper to bumper. And so I want to encourage us to embrace that idea. Uh, all the way back, and it's been a few years, uh, my freshman year at college, uh, when I went in and they were registering for me for all the classes, and they pretty much told me what to take, uh, I noticed one of the classes uh, had a word next to it that scared me to death. It was the word physics. How many of you have ever taken a physics class? And I looked at my schedule, my first uh, semester of my freshman year, the, the schedule was given to me, and I saw that word physics, and I said, you know, you realize that I graduated in the top half of the bottom 25% of my high school, right? <laughs> and the, the counselor, she said, no, this is where athletes go. We call it football physics. How many of you at least had one of those in your college, right? And it truly was. It was the rudimentary basic physics. And I learned something there that I want to share with you today that I think applies to our life as we talk about momentum. It was by a guy named Newton. How many of you remember Newton? He had three laws of motion, all right? The good news is there won't be a test. Some of you are immediately thinking, I'm failing. It won't be a test. You remember his three laws of motion? Law number one had to do with the idea of inertia. It says objects or bodies at rest have a tendency to stay at rest. Remember that? And it says objects in motion have a tendency to stay in motion. So as you reflect back on your 2022 and you journey into your 2023, let me ask you to reflect back quickly on your spiritual journey in 2022. Man, were you a spiritual object, a, a servant of God, a man or a woman or a young boy or young girl, that when you look back at your 2022, that you think in your mind, man, I was an object in motion. I was pursuing God in worship and his study of his words and with other people around me and serving and going on mission. Was I an object, a person, a child of God that we just sang about, that I was at motion? Or were you more in 2022 kind of an object at rest? That your spiritual momentum wasn't that important to you? Can I just challenge you, encourage you, and also warn you? With that first law of motion, doesn't just apply in the physics realm. I truly believe it applies in the spiritual realm. If you are at rest and you don't change something spiritually, you will remain at rest and not go as fast with God or as far with God in 2023 as he wants you to go. If you are in motion, last year, can I encourage you to keep the pedal to the metal and go as fast and as far with God this year as you ever thought you possibly could. 
How many of you remember the second law? It had to do with force and acceleration. It says the more force that is exerted on an object, the faster it accelerates and the further it goes. So with your spiritual journey this year, can I encourage you with this to apply some force to your spiritual growth? Say, you know what? I'm going to do, I'm going to deliver some horsepower. And as a church, we are setting before you um, this series to kick you off. We've got a daily Bible reading plan. If you haven't text plan, text plan. Uh, if you like uh, a book, if you want to hold it, we have this daily devotion or you can get a Man, I want to encourage you to say, you know what? I'm going to apply some force. If you apply a little force this year, you will grow a little. If you apply a lot of force this year, you will grow a lot with God. So I want to encourage us with thought number one, man, if you are a spiritual body at rest, if you don't change something, you're going to stay at rest. If you're a spiritual body in motion from 2022, stay in motion, but also continue to deliver the force. Now, how many of you remember the third? Those two are encouraging. How many remember number three? It had to do with resistance. For every action, remember this, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So here's what that means. If you make a commitment in your life, in your spiritual journey, that 2023 is going to be different. I'm not going to be inert. I'm not going to be a body at rest. I am going to apply some force. I'm going to apply as much force as I can so I can go as fast as I can and as far as I can with God. But I also have to understand that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. That if you are here today and you are making a commitment that I'm going to go as far as I can and as fast as I can with God, can I tell you that there are going to be opposite actions that come against you? You say, Pastor, what are those? For some, it might be some old habits, some past sin, some addictions. For some, it's not any of those. It's not necessarily past sin. It's not an addiction. It's not an old habit. Some of you the force that is going to be applied against you and your commitment to run with God as fast and as far as you can, some of you, it's just going to be old habits. It's going to be a time schedule. There are going to be things that you say, all right, I'm going to wake up tomorrow. I'm going to text plan. I'm going to get my Bible. Work. Then I'm going to get my devotion. I'm going to read it. Then I'm going to start today with plan. And then all of a sudden you wake up and you get an early morning phone call. And then you decide you're hungry. And then you say, hey, I need another cup of coffee. And then you look up and it's time to go to bed. And sometimes the equal and opposite reaction. It's just our old habits. They're not bad habits. But they're the kind of things that aren't going to allow us to go as far or as fast with God as God wants us to go. Beyond that, we have a culture and a climate that is developing around us, if you haven't noticed, that's pretty anti God's Word. How many of us have understood that? So when we look at Joshua chapter 1 and God says, make his word come out of your lips, we're going to see that here in a second. Don't be shocked when you get an equal and opposite reaction. When someone says, no, 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 you can't say that. That's hateful, that's bitter, that's angry, that's this. And it's not. It's just that you are willing in this moment, in this space, in this time, you are willing to deal with the opposite reaction because stating truthfully and lovingly God's Word is what we have to do. So let's look at this third echo. Look at Joshua chapter 1, verse uh, 9. I love this. This is where we're going to close the service, but I want to start it off here. Here's, here's what God says. This is the third echo, by the way. He says, Have I not commanded you, third echo, be strong and courageous? Prior verses, he said, be strong and courageous. Prior verse, he said, be strong and courageous. Third time. And God is talking to Joshua. He says, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. When you think of that word strong, you look through God's word. It just in the Old Testament. The children of Israel or or individuals or prophets or priests or kings or David or, or shepherd boys or whoever it is, 300 times. The people of God are told to be strong. 
So as you journey into 2023, I want you to know you better buckle up and you better be strong. That word strong means to be firm or to prevail or even to win. So God says, listen, when you face adversaries, difficulties, hardship, man, you got to firm up a little bit. You got to strengthen yourself up. Then he adds that word, be strong and courageous. And that word courageous is used 41 times in the Old Testament. And it really has two different kind of meanings. One of those meanings of courageous has to do when you are facing an adversary. We're actually going to see that in this passage, that he says, when you go into the land, the land I'm going to show you, the land of the Hittites and the Amorites and the other Vites and all those other things, there are some enemies that you are going to have to be courageous against. That's, that's one definition of the word courage. But we're also going to see the second Hebrew definition of this word courage right here in this passage. It's not just being courageous when facing an adversary, but instead it also has to do with being courageous and resolute, holding on to God's law. And when you begin to study God's word, and you begin to live God's word, and you begin to speak God's word to other people, I want you to know, you're going to have to be resolute that there are going to be times that people say this and you're going to say, no, 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 this is right, this is wrong. And people are going to come against you and say, man, uh, what do you think you're doing telling me what's right and what's wrong? Is that true? And that's when you're going to be faced with that moment. Am I, am I going to be courageous and hold on to God's law or am I going to shrink back in fear? Because there are some things that sap our courage. Man, the enemies in the land, that's what sapped the children of Israel's courage 40 years before this time with Joshua. Man, there are going to be enemies in your life that if you aren't careful and if I aren't careful, that I can, be, I can, I can have courage just flee. I can stop being resolute. Sometimes the thing that saps our courage, being resolute in God's Word, it's my past problems, it's my past difficulties, it's a lot of different things. But I want you to know, God says to us today, just like he said to Joshua in those days, have I not commanded you? Have I not commanded you? Have I not commanded you? And have I not commanded you that are viewing online to be strong and courageous? You say, but pastor, we live in a culture and a society, man, uh, politically the structure is against you, universities against you, this against us, this against us. Man, how am I going to be strong and courageous? Can I just remind you, mind you of a guy named Daniel? Remember, Daniel was a, a young boy. Uh, the children of Israel had, had abandoned worship of God, so God removed his hand of protection. And so Daniel was taken off to a foreign land with a pagan ruler, and you come to Daniel chapter 10, verse 19. Daniel is now serving under his third pagan ruler. He has a dream and he has a vision. And in the midst of that dream and in the midst of that vision, Daniel gets fearful. And I love what the angel of the Lord said to Daniel. He says, do not be afraid. Same word. He says, you are highly esteemed. You know what he's saying? You are a child of God. He says, you are highly esteemed. Peace. Be strong now. Be strong. So what God was doing is he was showing up to Daniel who, 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 through no fault of his own, was caught up in the exile. He was taken to a different place with a pagan ruler, served under one, became part of his uh, kingly court, then served under another, became part of the kingly court. And all he's done has been faithful. But here he is in his latter days, still needing to be told, do not be afraid be strong now. Be strong. And so maybe you're here today and you're like, man, will there come a day in my spiritual journey or my spiritual life that I won't be fearful, that I won't be afraid, that I won't need courage? No. So if you're a newbie to the faith, and praise God, as we look back over 2022, we had so many people that came to faith in Christ and had the opportunity to baptize them. And you think, man, will I ever get over this fear of being rejected by other people? Probably not. But God's word will tell you over and over again, whether you're young in your faith or old in your faith, whether you're new to your faith, whether you're growing in your faith, whether you're spiritually at rest, man, God shows up to you and says, do not be afraid. So I thought I would just take uh, Joshua chapter 1 today, and I'll give you five thoughts straight from these passages on how to be strong and courageous 
in 2023. Number one is simply this. You have to embrace the new reality. Things have changed. There are certain things in your life and there are certain things in my life that I'm never going to bring back. Boy, sometimes I long for the good old days and I still don't consider myself that old. How many of you know what I'm talking about? 2022 has been put in the books. There are certain things that have changed, that there is a new reality. You either either embrace it or get run over by it. Man, there are certain things we can't go back to. I don't know if you've been, you've been watching with, with much interest, but imagine if you were an employee of Twitter right now. How many of you know things have changed? All right, if you are an employee of Twitter, good for you. But here's the reality. I, I'm, not, I, I'm not saying I, I love Elon Musk, but he's at least entertaining. How many of you know? But it's been interesting to watch that culture of that corporate organization as they try to act and react to what is going on, saying, what is this? And mass layoffs or, or, or rejection or whatever. Man, and everybody's saying he's running it into the ground. And others are saying, no, it's going to go, through the, uh, go to the sky. And you don't know. Either way, it's just fun watching. But here is the reality. That is a change, and it's not going back. You have to embrace the reality. Uh, hey, many of you, uh, uh, perhaps uh, some ladies here, some men here, that, that you enjoy the royalty. How many of you know there's a big transition in royalty over in Britain and the UK this year? Man, after 70 years, the longest in monarchy's history, Queen Elizabeth died, and now there's a king. Her son is in charge. That is a new reality. If you look in God's Word, there are changes that happen over and over and over again that they either had to embrace the new reality or get run over. Remember Joseph? Joseph grew up in a home, a pretty good home, and, and all he did was had a dream that he was going to rule over his brothers, and then he shared it with them. And then they sold him into slavery. Man, don't you think he longed to be back with his parents from time to time? But instead, what did he do? He got sold into, into slavery, went to Potiphar's house, and embraced the new reality. Just began to be faithful to God and faithful to Potiphar, made it all the way to the top in Potiphar's house. Then he was lied against. Do you think he wanted to be lied about? No. But he's thrown into prison. What does he have to do? He has to embrace a new reality. The new reality is, is I'm not in Potiphar's house anymore. I'm not even in my parents' house anymore. I'm in prison so he had to embrace a new reality and say, man, I'm just going to be what God wants me to be right here and right now. And it says he raises up to where he's up, basically the captain of all the guards, of all the slaves. He encounters a couple of men that he interprets some dreams for. And all he asks is one thing. He said, listen, when you get back before the king and the Pharaoh, remember me. And guess what? It says they forgot him. What did Joseph have to do? He had to embrace the new reality that those he trusted in had forgotten about him. But ultimately, God showed up and he ended up being second in line next to Pharaoh because he what? He just simply, in the midst of change, embraced the new reality. Child of God, here's the point. Is there are certain things in your life and in my life that have changed. It might be a job. It might be a career. It might be your health. It might have it be your relationships. I want to encourage us to embrace the new reality. I am where I am. I am who I am. And I want to be all that God wants me to be based on this new reality. And maybe some of you went through incredible loss in 2022. Maybe it was a career. Maybe it was a spouse. Maybe it was a health. Maybe it was a loved one. Maybe some of you failed in a way last year that you never thought you would fail in. Can I just encourage you to embrace the new reality and understand that God can still use me. You say, where do you see this, Pastor, in the passage? Look at Joshua chapter 1. Pick it up as we read in verse 1, and here it is. Joshua chapter 1, it says, After the death of Moses, full stop, there's the new reality. 
is that God shows up and talks to Joshua. Now think about Joshua. Pretty much since Moses was called at the burning bush, Joshua has been Moses' strong assistant. He, he was the number two man. He, he was next in line. But all of a sudden now, there is a new reality. Moses is gone. The one that trained him, the one that covered for him, the one that called him out, the one that encouraged him, the one that said, Joshua, I'm going to be up here on the hill. I'm going to raise my hands. You go fight the enemy. And every time Joshua looked up, he could always count on Moses having his hands up. And when they won, when they were winning, Moses had his hands up. When they got tired, they all of a sudden were losing. Joshua always had the ability to look at Moses there's a new reality. This is after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord. The Lord said to Joshua, who was the aide to Moses, my servant Moses is dead. Now then you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land that I'm about to give them to all the Israelites. So here's the point. If we're going to gain spiritual momentum and get back on track with God, you have to embrace the new reality. Man, I don't know what has changed in your life. Maybe, maybe it's all for the good. Embrace the good. Embrace the new reality. Maybe it's been all for the bad the last couple of years. Embrace the new reality. We are where we are. But here's what I want to encourage you with. Even when you embrace the new reality, God still has something for you to do, and he has somewhere he wants you to go. That's what it says right there. It says, listen, Moses, my servant, is dead. So I ask a question. I put it in your app. Here's the question. What is your new reality? What things, when you are honest, that you are looking back for and you are longing for, that they're never coming back, that they're holding you back? And just embrace the new reality. Say, that career's not coming back. That job's not coming back. That relationship's not coming back. I don't know if that prodigal son or prodigal daughter, I don't know if that prodigal father or prodigal mother, I don't know if they're going to come back. Man, the loved one I lost. There is a new reality. If you've been embedded in the core at Cottonwood Creek for a while, you know just in the last couple of months, we lost a couple of longtime superstars leaders in our church, deacons in our church, that I knew every time I walked out of my door, they were going to be looking at me going, Pastor, we're praying for you. Pastor, we love you. Pastor, we care for you. Send me text, encourage me. And all of a sudden, they died. And there are life group classes and groups of bodies of believers and deacons that are sitting there going, man, we're going to miss them. But I can tell you this, if they were here, they would all say, there's still work to be done. God wants to show up in your life. Say, this is your time. This is your day to move forward. So write down. Put it in your app. Put it in your notes. What is my new reality? And write it down. And here, here's number two. Claim God's promises for your future. If you're going to develop spiritual momentum, you have to claim God's promises for your future. And now here, what does that mean? Not your own desires, not your own wants, but what has God promised you? For everybody who comes to him by faith through Jesus Christ, they will have salvation. God promises that. God promises you if you study his word, you will be successful. That word successful means to act wisely. Man, if I, that's a promise that God gives us. If we will study, if we will apply energy, effort, worship together, celebrate together, serve together, go on mission together, those are all promises. But there are also some specific promises. Maybe, maybe there are some of you that you've studied God's Word and you've been reading God's Word and you feel like God gave you a promise a year ago or a couple of months ago or maybe even uh, several years ago and you're like, man, I'm ready to throw in the towel and give up. Can I encourage you with this to claim God's promises for your future? even if it takes some time for it to show up. Think about what we're seeing here in Joshua chapter 1. The children of Israel, we're going to see this over the next couple of weeks, the children of Israel are prepping and being prepared to go into the promised land. Well, how long has it taken for the original promise to be made where the children of Israel are finally going to the promised land? Well, go all the way back to Genesis chapter 12 where God showed up and talked to Abram 
All right? He said, Abraham, I want you to leave your people. I'm going to show you a land. I'm going to take you to a land that is flowing with milk and honey, a blessed land. Your offspring will be a blessing not only to you, but to the entire world. That's the promise. How long did it take? 25 years before Isaac shows up. And then Isaac waits 60 years. So here we are, 25 plus 60, before Jacob shows up. Then Jacob has a bunch of sons, one of them being Joseph, by the way, who goes off into Egypt. Joseph just embraces his new reality. Finally, there's a famine in the land. Man, Joseph's dad and brothers have to come to Egypt. And they find Joseph there as basically the number one guy next to the Pharaoh. They're watching. Then it says, as you continue to read God's story, remember the promise. It says, a Pharaoh grew up who did not remember Joseph, and he enslaved the children of Israel. So here we are, promise, 25 years, 60 years, a number of other years. Now 400 plus years, the children of Israel are in slavery. Are God's promises still good? Absolutely. Because then all of a sudden, God shows up to a guy named Moses through a burning bush and says, Moses, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go make a deal with Pharaoh. He says, God says, I'm going to give you these 10 plagues. Go see if you can trade these 10 plagues for my people. And so they go in, they make the play, make the ultimate trade. And finally, plague number one, plague number two, plague number three, plague number four, all the way to plague number 10. Remember, you've at least seen the movie, right? That, that Pharaoh says, I got an idea. Get all of these people, y'all go, and you can have all our money. Then they begin to journey through, and then all of a sudden they come to a place where the Red Sea's in front of them and, and the Egyptian army's behind them. And don't you think they didn't question the promises of God? As a matter of fact, we know they did. What did they say? They said, Moses, wouldn't it have been better for us to die back in Egypt? Newsflash, we still kind of ask that question today, don't we? Don't we say, man, I long for the good old days? I wish I could go back to this, or I wish I could go back to that. Can I just encourage you with this, child of God? Don't ever long to go back when God wants you to long to go forward. Man, you have to embrace God's promise for the future, and don't ever sit here and go, man, this is going to be hard. So what happened is through this leader, Moses, Moses shows up. He lifts his hand. God parts the waters. The children of Israel go through, go through uh, on dry ground, and all of a sudden the enemies of God are destroyed. And then they march straight through a place, and, and, and Moses said, listen, I'm going to go up on the mountain. God's got something to say. Moses goes up on the mountain, gives Ten Commandments, gets Ten Commandments, comes back down. They've already started worshiping different gods. Moses ultimately has to deliver judgment to the people, and so does God. And then he says, let's go on to the promised land. They get right to the edge of the promised land. And instead of sending them all in, they send some spies in. You remember the story. You can go read about it in Numbers 13, 14, 15. The spies go in the land and said, man, they come back out and they said, the grapes in there are ginormous, but so are the cities and so are enemies. Now listen to this. The children of Israel were swayed and fearful. They had come so close, but instead of going into the promised land, they turned around and head back towards the desert. Child of God, here's my point at the beginning of this new year. Every one of us is standing at the precipice of where God wants us to go and what God wants us to be. And my greatest fear for some of you is you've been here before. You've been moved by a message or God's word or a song and worship that you say, man, I'm a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to sin. I'm not going back to where I've been, but I'm going ahead to where you want me to go, God. And as you're sitting here today, some of you have been here before. And you walked away. And so the question for you became, is this promise still good? Now listen to this. Remember, they walked around in the desert for 40 years only to come back to the same Jordan river with the same land that was promised to them and that's where we see joshua chapter one so here's where every one of us is today i believe 
that it doesn't matter if you've come close a number of times and you've always turned and walked away and headed back to the desert. God is inviting every person in this room, in this room and online, God is saying, are you willing to go in? Are you willing to be who God wants you to be, where God wants you to be, with full momentum developing your walk with God? So claim God's promises. Let me ask you a question. Promised Abram, 25 years. 60 years, Isaac. Joseph, number of years. Then what do you have? Jacob. You had Jacob. And then you have Egypt, 450 years. Then you have almost in the promised land and another journey around the desert for 40 years. You are coming close to, listen to this, Seven hundred years from promise to fulfillment. Are God's promises still good? Absolutely. So if you feel like God has promised you something through His Word and it's a place God wants you, don't ever give up ever, ever on God's promises. Pick it up. Let's just continue to read as we look at it. Verse 3. Here's what God promised said, man, after all that time, the fulfillment. He says, Joshua, I will give you, now underline this. I want you to see this in the original. This is the Hebrew word plural, you. Everybody say, that's us. Okay? There's always, as you read through this passage, you can't see it in the Hebrew. There are times that God says, you, Joshua, singular. Then there are other times he says, you, plural, the people. This is one of those times, I will give you, plural, the people, every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses, okay, your foot, plural. He says, your territory will extend from the desert Lebanon and from the great river Euphrates, all the Hittite hill country. And he says, even to the Mediterranean Sea. Now, here's, here's something that we need to understand. Just intuitively reading into that, God is telling Joshua, there are still enemies in the land. There are still hardships in the land. So child of God, I want you to know, as we think about making, developing spiritual momentum in 2023, I want you to know, there are still enemies ahead of you. There are still hardships ahead of you. That's why God echoes it for him and for us three times. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Because even when we go with God, where God wants us to go, and we grow with him, and we develop spiritual momentum, we will still encounter difficulties. Now continue to read. Look at verse 5. He says, but if you follow me, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. See, that's a, that's a promise you and I can hold on to. Is that if I'm following God doing what God has called me to do, heading where God wants me to go, living the way God wants me to live. Yes, I will still encounter enemies, but no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. That's a promise we need to claim, regardless of how long it takes for that promise to be fulfilled. Here's number three. Don't repeat past mistakes. Just that simple. Don't repeat past mistakes. When you look back over your 2022 or your 2021 or 2020 or 2019, what are some mistakes that you've made in your life, some sins that you've committed in your life that have hold, held you back, that have tripped you up? Then the encouragement is if we're going to develop spiritual momentum, don't ever keep repeating past mistakes. What was the children of Israel's past mistakes? Look at it back to verse 3. Look at Joshua chapter 1 verse 3. He says, I will give you every place where you set your foot. Stop. What was the children of Israel's past mistake? Forty years earlier, they came up to the promised land. They stood at the edge of the promised land. They sent in some spies. They were discouraged by the spies. And instead of setting their foot in the promised land, they turned and headed back to the desert. That was a past sin that the children of Israel had, right? So here's what God is saying to Joshua and the people. Don't repeat a past mistake. 
What was the past mistake? They came up to the edge of the promised land. They knew God had promised it. They sent a report. They heard spies. By the way, Joshua will send spies. We're going to look at this. Their spies come in and say, man, it's a big city, but we better go. See, that's not repeating a past mistake. So I want to encourage you to make a list. What are, are there some men in this room or some men watching online that, that, that there is a secret sin, an old habit that keeps showing up as a past mistake that keeps you from being the husband, the man, uh, the dad, uh, or whoever, the employee or the employer that God wants you to be. Maybe there's some ladies in here. They, man, there are some past sins and some past mistakes that keep resurfacing in your life. And they keep you from being all that God wants you to be. Can I encourage you? Man, it's time to set your foot into the promised land. And so I want to encourage you. How do you do that? You don't repeat past mistakes. As we're going to read through the book of Joshua over the next couple of weeks, we're going to see the enemies are still real, the cities are still big, and the, and the difficulty and the odds of them winning are still stacked against them. But they are not, with Joshua's leadership, going to repeat a past mistake and turn around and go a different way. But instead, they're going to head in. So here's the question. What past mistakes hold you back from being anyone and everyone that God wants you to be? Here's number four. Personal action is required. Remember Newton's laws of motion? The amount of force you put against something determines the acceleration of an object. Same way with your spiritual life, your spiritual journey. How much effort and energy are you willing to put into your faith to grow your faith? Now listen, salvation doesn't come by my effort. That's by the grace of God. But what does God say? For by grace you have been saved. Paul says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Salvation is a gift, not effort. But then it says, God created us for a purpose for work that we are called out to do. So what does that mean? That you and I now put in the effort that you put in the energy, whatever it is. And notice what it says, Joshua chapter 1, verse 7. Here's what he says. This is the second echo of the be strong and courageous, but notice there's a word inserted. Verse 7, personal action is required. He says, Joshua, be strong and very. Everybody say very. It's interesting. This is of the three echoes of be, be strong and courageous. This is where God tells Joshua, to be very strong, not just strong and courageous, but be very strong and be very courageous. Remember I told you there's two meanings to courageous. One is being cour cour courageous when you're facing an adversary. And the other one is to be resolute and not giving up ground that you already hold. What is he talking about here? Notice what he says. Be strong and very courageous as it relates to the law of God. He says, be careful to obey, that's personal action, all the law my servant Moses gave you. Now notice this, do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that's an action. So here's what I'm going to do, I'm going to obey it, I'm not going to turn to the right, I'm not going to turn to the left, instead I'm going to be very resolute, very courageous, notice I'm not going to turn to the left, turn to the right, that we would be successful wherever we go. Look at verse 8, keep this book of the law. Always on your lips. Now, let me just stop you right there. Underline that. Or ladies, take out lipstick and just circle that word. And let me tell you why. That Hebrew word lips means out loud. That means that when you and I leave here, we talk about what we learned. We should talk about what God's word tells us. We should be open about it. And so here's what he says, man, it should always be on your lips. We should meditate it. That's an, ex, uh, that's an action there on it day and night. So that what? So that we'd be careful to do everything written in it. Then everybody say then. All right. After we've been faithful, a lot of us want God to prosper us and make us successful, but we don't do everything before the then. He says, you will be successful. By the way, if you want to write this down, that word successful is not what you and I normally think of. The Hebrew word successful simply means to act wisely. To act wisely. How many of you know there are times in our life that we can act wisely and still lose? Right? 
take a coach. Coach can make the right call, and it just didn't work out, right? That word successful, a lot of times we think, well, my bank account's going to get filled up. My car's going to be nicer. My house is going to get bigger. That's not sex. He says acting wisely. That's the Hebrew translation for that word successful is that in everything you do, you would be able to act wisely. Well, how does that happen? Only if you study God's word, obey God's word, listen to God's word, read God's word, meditate on God's word, talk about God's word, do all of those things. But you better be very courageous, resolute. So here's where I want you to know we are. Anytime we do a spiritual growth seminar at our church, that's when we put together a daily devotion. That's when we put together a Bible verse that we can send you every day. Why? Because we want it to always be on your mind. We want it to be on your lips. We want it to be on your heart so we can act wisely in everything that we do. But here's what we also know. God said be very courageous, resolute, that we live in a culture and a climate where people want us to be quiet about our faith. How many of you have noticed that? And there are times when we have to speak the words of God and culture will complain. But we've still got to be very courageous to say, no, this is what God's Word says, and we're going to stand on it because we know it is right for human flourishing because God's the one that created us in His image. Just let me give you a a heads up. If you're new here at Cottonwood Creek, every weekend you come in, whether it's on Saturday night or whether it's Sunday morning, the Bible is going to be open for you. And we're going to read a passage of Scripture. Every point we ever give you is going to come straight from a verse. You're going to be able to see this passage, don't repeat past mistakes, comes from this verse. You will always be able to see it. So every time, don't be shocked, don't be surprised. Every time you come in here and say, I'll say, here's your point, this is the verse. Beyond that, if you notice what he's taught, what God said to Joshua, those were all verbs. It was action, 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 action. Read it, obey it, live it, talk about it, meditate on it. Those are all action. That's why if you read, I'll tell you, for the next 52 weeks, every point I deliver to you will come from a verse and it will have an action verb in it. It will say, do this, do this. You say, why do you do that, Pastor? Well, because Jesus ultimately gave us that example. If you go to Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, in the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever preached, Jesus talks in Matthew chapter 5 about the Beatitudes and this and that and the large gate and the small gate and this one and that. He talks about all of these things, hypocrisy and stewardship. and everything. Comes to the end of that incredible Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus said the wise man is the person that not just hears these words, but hears them and obeys them. So that's why I want to always give you a hook to walk out of here with four or five or sometimes 10 or 12 points that my guess is, now listen, here's what I hope. My guess is there's a dude in this room that you've locked in on that point. Don't repeat past mistakes. There might be a a lady here that you are saying, I've got to embrace my new reality. Things have changed. And so that's why we do this. But here's a further point. When you begin to talk about it and walk and live out God's word, then you'll be successful. Act wisely in everything you do. But personal action is required. I I gave you a list of things that you can get involved in. Man, read God's word daily. Surround yourself with God's people. All of these things. And here's number five. Remember God's command to be strong and courageous. Man, when you leave here, I want you to know, you have to remember God's commands to be strong and courageous. Say, where do you see that? Verse 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. You know what he's saying? There's there's a reality here. There are going to be times that you leave here that you are faithful to God and you are going to be scared to death. Be strong and courageous. He goes, there's going to be some times that you go out of here and you get discouraged. Be strong and courageous. Notice this. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. 
That's how we start this year off. And encourage them to be strong and courageous. Embrace your new reality. Claim God's promises for your future. Don't repeat past mistakes. Personal action is required. Be involved. Man, force is what it takes. And then finally, remember God's command to be strong and courageous. Here's how I want to end today, same way I ended the earlier service. I want to invite us to stand as a congregation. Everybody stand. And if you think of the central focus and the central part of all the book of Joshua, we're going to pull out over other things over the next couple of weeks. It really comes down to verse 6 to 9. Where there are times that God is speaking to Joshua, the person. There are times that he is speaking to the children of Israel, the people. And I just want to read it over us because here's what I also know. If you're a man out here, you're leading somebody. You're either going to lead them to the promised land or back to the desert. There's some ladies in here that you're leading somebody and you're leading some people. You're going to either lead them into the promised land or lead them back in the desert. There are some young people in here that you've got friends around you. You're either going to lead them into the promised land or back to the wilderness. So the challenge for us, church, is to be reminded that we are a child of God. And so I just want you to hear this as I read this over you as we begin this new year. God said, be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore their ancestors to give them. Verse 7, be strong and very courageous, but be careful, listen to this, to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you, and do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep the book of the law, God's word, always on your lips, that means out loud, meditate on it in your mind day and night, so that what? You'd be careful to obey it and do everything that was written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Look at verse 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid when circumstances are against you. Do not be discouraged when things and problems pile up, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. As a church, our commitment in 2023 is that we're going to apply a force to our spiritual journey. And we're going to pick up speed. And the invitation for you is join us. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this day. God, thank you for the challenge that this, this passage has been to me over the last couple of weeks as I've prepared to preach this message that I need to be the man that this church needs me to be. I need to be the man of God that my family needs, to be, needs me to be. I need to be the man of God that our, my friends need me to be. But God, everybody in this room can say that same prayer. They need to be the mom or the dad, the husband or the wife, the son or the daughter, the grandmother, the grandfather that those they lead need them to be. God, we accept the challenge and say yes to momentum. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.